What's up guys, today we're gonna to be talking about three common abuses in the prophetic and how to avoid them, which is really good. And number one, I labeled this, people who are the devil's ex-lovers make huge claims on what will curse you. And this means that people who come out of witchcraft or Satanism or one of these different types of genres, maybe they're a high level Mason, and because of their experience was so detrimental to them and because they were willfully participating with ritualism and with ceremonies and with the demonic, they a lot of times are overly sensitive to what Christians are doing who are not participating in ceremonial religious ways to things like Disney movies or certain holidays or whatever. And they put these claims like, if you do this, you will be cursed. If you have this in your life, you will definitely have a demon that will visit your house. And I love what Proverbs 26, 2 says. It says, like a fluttering sparrow or darting swallow, an undeserved curse does not come to rest. And so people who are involved in witchcraft many times don't understand the difference between a deserved curse and an undeserved curse. A deserved curse means you are willfully participating and allowing yourself, like you're reading astrology, you are going to a psychic, you are going to a medium, you are practicing a holiday in a spiritual way, you're using a Ouija board on Halloween. Those kinds of things bring the demonic. They bring assignments to you from the enemy. The enemy is looking for those doorways. But for you to go to a birthday costume party and dress up as a you know certain character, or for you to watch a Disney movie or whatever, those are not going to bring curses on your family, especially if you're discerning. And uh, sometimes people come to your house and say, you know, is there an open door in your house for why the sickness is there? And they'll look for things like your kids draw pictures of J.R. Tolkien stuff, or they look at stuff like, do you have certain Disney movies on your shelf? And they immediately say, burn those things and now you will be healed. But that's very rarely actually brought about true fruit of healing. And I want to encourage you that uh, the religious spirit likes to legalize things and even ritualize things. And it's very similar to a witchcraft spirit. It causes you to feel like there's a cause and effect for everything you do, as opposed to what it says in Titus 1.15, where to the pure, all things are pure. That means you can go buy a billboard that might affect other people because it's a horror movie and you're pure in your heart. You don't even notice it. You're not even eating it. You're not even, you don't even have to digest it because it's not even coming up. You can look at it and go, ugh. Oh, yeah. You know, in Jesus name, go away, whatever, you're done. Or you are watching a preview in a movie and it's a really dark movie and you can literally not receive it into your spirit or not see it or not let it stay with you because it's not something you would par willfully participate with. It came before a movie you're going to watch and some Christians get really legalistic like that might now curse you. You have to do some sort of ceremony. You have to do some sort of prayer march. You have to do some sort of whatever. And I just want to encourage you, don't allow other people's fear and their fear tactics to cause ritualization of your Christianity to make you feel like you have to do anything beyond repentance. If you repent for something you've willfully participated with, it's done. If you say, God, protect me from the enemy, it's done for things you didn't willfully participate with. You don't have to feel like just because your kids went to a certain party where they had a certain theme that you are now entering into the devil's ground and you are married to the devil. This is so bizarre, but there's books that sensationalize witchcraft to Christians. And God bless everybody who's come out of witchcraft and Satanism and these things and their journey and their story. But so much of their story does not apply to the average Christian faith. And so much of it gets blown out of proportion when it's applied. And there's so much fear in it. So as soon as you get touched by someone else's fear from their life experience with the enemy, make sure that you realize where is your life experience with God? And has there been a place for fear or a place of agreement in any of the similar areas? I mean, these people have you know been in places where there's been baby sacrificed, human sacrifice, rituals that have been for cursing. Have you ever lived a life where there's any of that? No. So you probably don't have to be afraid of similar consequences or the darkness that comes with that. And I think that's it's a really important subject. Number two, we have prophets who use bad theology to declare judgment because of sin over cities, industries, and individuals. And this one's terrible. It's a, we want Jesus to pay the price again on the cross because of their sin city, Las Vegas, or because there's a bad part of Los Angeles, or because, you know, there's in Thailand, there's the red light district that's like so extreme with human trafficking. We want these cities to be destroyed. You know, it's the Christian religious mindset wants everyone to reap what they've sown. But what Jesus did was he cut us off through the blood of reaping all that we've sown in humanity. As a matter of fact, he, he became the curse on the tree. He became the judgment on the tree. He took all judgment to himself. We, he doesn't need to die again. God is no longer speaking judgments over regions and cities and industries and people. He is saying sometimes you will reap what you've sown. He won't always cut that off, especially if there's no repentance, but he's not looking to recreate the price of the tree again. And there's so many Christians who they get very uptight or they get very affected by something. Maybe it's in popular culture. Their granddaughter all of a sudden falls into sin because of some celebrity. So then they begin to prophesy against celebrities who are doing this thing. God will judge you. And that's like, that's such 
an immature place of how we use our voice. Even Peter said, you know, do you want me to call down fire from heaven, you know, on these ones? And Jesus said, no, you're not. What spirit are you? Like of what spirit are you when you want to see the judgment of God come on the people he loves? For God so loved the world that he sent his son. He wants to come to these areas of extreme darkness and use you as a great light. That means a light of hope. Salvation is a gospel of hope and good news. Prophecy should be a gift of hope and good news. If you've been used in prophecy that's not good news, it may not be God. And so you need to repent of that and actually say, God, show me how to agree in the midst of what I'm discerning. There's negative things I'm discerning, like witchcraft or there's sin in this area. What do you say, Father? And God will probably show you not what the enemy's doing or what man's doing wrong. He'll probably give you redemptive hope and a redemptive story that his son paid a price for through his blood on the cross. And we have to stay focused on that versus a lot of the mysticism or a lot of the, the, the reaping and sowing words that we want to give because we want justice. We have to give words that are beyond that, which are kingdom words. Number three, prophets who have a gift of exaggerating all the time. And we see this as a, one of the temptations when you're growing into prophetic. If you see someone who's going to get a resource in their life and so you say, you will be a millionaire versus you're going to have the next resource you need for the job at hand. We upgrade it or we get excited. I know with one of our team members, she was praying over someone in the front row of, of a meeting. She was her first time like really practicing this way. And it was a prophetic training meeting. So it was okay. And she said, I see acting on you, which is a great word. The girl wants to be an actress. And she said, I feel like you're going to win an Academy Award being the next Meryl Streep. And in her heart, her heart and humanity took the jump, not her faith, from acting to you're going to be one of the greatest in a generation. And that causes the person who's prophesied over to have no power because now they can't be happy doing a hemorrhoid commercial. They can only do what Meryl Streep's doing to be actually fulfilled and happy because that's their real calling. And we need to not exaggerate to people we're prophesying to. A lot of it's done over money and finances. You will own a plane versus maybe the person's going to have 10 times in their lifetime where they're on a private plane. Maybe God showed you a glance in the future where they would have that. And he was just encouraging them that there's times that you will go places by private plane or by first class or whatever that will be part of a signpost of how God's using you versus you will have a private plane. You will be the next Kenneth Copeland and have three planes or whatever. It's like we have to come back into understating what God's saying so that we can come into a place of real faith that people can tie their, their, their actual action steps around. Most prophecy that's promise of potentials for the now or the immediate future, not 30 years from now. So when you give someone a word that's for like, you know, you're going to be the next John G. Lake and heal everybody. And they had a hundred thousand documented miracles. And they don't even have one documented miracle. And so they're thinking, do I buy a tent? What do I do? Where do I get trained? There's nowhere to get trained to be John G. Lake. I don't know what to do versus I'm going to learn about the healing gift and just be part of my local healing rooms and just be faithful and loyal in that and see what God will do. So maybe I have a portion of a John G. Lake spirit, but it doesn't mean that I'm actually John G. Lake, the next one, you know, the next person that God's anointing that way. But I have Jesus, the healer inside of me. And so I could pray for healing and have great fulfillment in that. And so one of the biggest errors that people make is over exaggerate prophetic words to the point where you can't even walk in faith in those words. And we want to take these three areas and avoid them at all costs. We want to make sure to be balanced Christians who actually have a balanced prophetic message that gives people steps and encouragement for the now that causes people to run to Jesus and look at him in the now and not feel overwhelmed in a way that it's like, oh, I don't know. Like, I don't even know if I could be that or if I want to do that. But we want to give them words about what God's saying in the now that aren't blown up. And we also want to help people in these other areas of not proclaiming judgment and also not making people walk through something to get unentangled from something that they weren't even entangled with in the first place. And these are so important that we we look at these things, go after them, and we pursue the balanced Christian prophetic life. So go for balance. And if you like this video, make sure to share it with people around you, especially if somebody maybe doesn't have this perspective, tag them in this because it's going to help them a whole lot. Make sure to subscribe and hit the notifications if you want to get the new videos every Monday. We're on your prophetic journey with you. Let's do this.